Maybe I'm crazy, but the Seahawks are playing for their football lives this Thursday. Welcome to the Maybe I'm Crazy podcast. I'm Joy Taylor. Thanks so much for joining us. This week, we talked to Kevin O'Connor from The Ringer. Crazy NBA stories happening for free agency this week. And also, it's the NBA draft Wednesday night. So we get into what we should be looking for in this draft. Is it as bad as everyone's saying it is? What kind of players are in it? And what is happening with James Harden? Crazy Gang is here. Donnie, T, and Heller. So we'll get into all the NFL news around the league as well. But let's get started with Kevin O'Connor. All right, very excited to have Kevin O'Connor on the Maybe I'm Crazy podcast this week, obviously from The Ringer, and you can follow him. Very good NBA follow. Um, If you are already on NBA Twitter, you probably already follow him. But (laughs) um, Kevin O'Connor, NBA. You know, NBA Twitter, you got to kind of feel your way through. Once it's like, it's like a, a fraternity or a sorority, but you just kind of find your way into it, <laughs> right? But, but everybody's accepted, you know, everybody's accepted because it's it's a great time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it's kind of a crazy week uh, or kind of crazy time in general for the NBA because obviously the bubble just ended and we're about to have the season start again in just a couple weeks, really. Um, and now we're in the middle of free agency, which we usually have a big buildup of anticipation and the draft is tomorrow night, which is also kind of strange because it's just a very weird draft this year. But the biggest news this week is James Harden possibly pushing his way to the Nets. Now, there's there's plenty of fire with this story already, so we can't even say that this it isn't a real story. But how legitimate do you think this is? I mean, it's kind of funny you say that's the biggest story when like Chris Paul, one of the greatest point guards ever, gets traded to Phoenix, and Giannis Antetokounmpo gets uh, Bogdan Bogdanovich and Drew Holiday as teammates, and yet James Harden still looms over all of it because he's currently the guy who's an MVP candidate, and it's so rare that these guys ever become available, and it's definitely real. He wants to leave Houston and, he, and his intentions are going to Brooklyn. The question I have, and I wrote about this this week on the ringer is why now for the Rockets, is there incentive to doing a deal now rather than going into the season with Harden, maybe not Westbrook, but at least with Harden showing him a new system under their new head coach, Steven Silas, having some new players in there. And then maybe a month from now or two months from now, Harden looks at the situation and he's like, you know what? I am happy here. Maybe he's not ready to extend, but if you're Houston, I think you got to at least try to slow play this. You can't just blow it up when you have a top five, top 10 player in the league. Like to me, I'm all about blowing it up, but right now I don't think it's the right time. You got to be a little bit more patient if you're Houston. There's not an overwhelming deal out there. But who, who has the power in this situation, right? Like who has the leverage? Harden. Harden, ultimately, he he's the guy who can, I mean, he has two years guaranteed left on his deal. So he signed through at least the 2021-22 season, and then he has a player option for the following year. So he has some amount of leverage, but still, Houston has at least two years of him if they want him. Uh, I think you're going to see Houston probably play this a little bit slow. I'm not sure if the Brooklyn offer, and I've heard they're throwing the kitchen sink. You know, all future first round draft picks, all potential pick swaps, Karis Levert, Spencer Dinwiddie, that's a pretty good offer. And I think for Houston, if they do that now, let's say a deal happens before the season, I think the reason to do it now, even though I'd wait, is the fact this is a good year to stink. You mentioned how this year's draft isn't, you know, it's not super exciting. There's no stars, there's no Zion. There are those guys in the 2021 class. So if you're Houston, it's not a bad idea if you think you're gonna inevitably have to trade Harden anyway, just to do it now, to have more weeks of not being a good team, (laughs) to have higher draft odds. Cause a guy like Cade Cunningham, he is like one of those no brainer number one prospects. He's gonna be a freshman in Oklahoma State. So for Houston, I mean, what an unfortunate situation. Like it wasn't too long ago, they were right in it in the postseason as finals contenders. And now, who knows what their future looks like. It's very bleak, especially with Tillman for Tita as their owner. I just, you know, Colin and I were talking about this on the show today and he was like, I don't know how good this is for the NBA. If it happens, like it's great for us because <laughs> we're content people and that's amazing. Content. Oh, yeah. But for the overall NBA mm-hmm. and for like Rockets fans and stuff, like how great is it that all of the stars are kind of going to the, you know, to the coast and whatnot. And my thing is this, like, 
Because you, you mentioned, like, it's unfortunate for the Rockets. Like, it is, but the, you did have him, and mm. you had Westbrook, and you could have made some other moves. And I just feel like it's n- – I don't blame any star for – or any player for that matter, not even just a star – for trying to take control of their career and put themselves in a position to win a championship. Because at the end of the day – guys like us are going to be the ones who talk about how they never won a championship, right? And fans yeah. are going to be the ones who are peddling them with, you know, tweets all day about how they're, they're not really that good, you know? And, like, not that that matters to anybody. I'm sure their legacy and them, you know, what they want as a competitor matters too. But, like, Houston, you had an opportunity. Yeah, and you know what? I think the difference for Harden is this isn't this wouldn't be KD going to Golden State where they already won, where they had Steph and Clay, where they just won 73 games, and they beat the Thunder in the postseason. People are already talking about how if Harden goes to Brooklyn, it's not going to work. It's going to blow up there because you got these big personalities like Kyrie. you got KD. you got Harden. People are already saying, where's the defense? Where's the leadership? This is not inevitably going to fail. So for Harden, if he goes to Brooklyn, which is a super team, I, if he wins there, I don't think anybody would be saying, oh, you, you rode the coattails of stars. That wouldn't be the case. This would be like a group of kind of like cast off stars, you know, guys that have some sort of reputation around the league winning together and uniting together. So for him, I don't think like the KD aspects going to Golden State would be a factor there. And for him, they provide him a better chance to win. He's into his 30s now. You mentioned how you can't blame any player, and I'm right there with you. I love the fact players, you know, have feel empowered, are taking control of their careers and trying to steer their way to the teams that they want to. But on the other hand, though, Houston doesn't have to trade them to Brooklyn. They could take the team that offers the most. My question is, will there be a team that steps up and offers more than what Brooklyn does? I've heard Philly with Daryl Morey is going to offer Ben Simmons and already has with more multiple first-round draft picks. But I've also been told Tillman Fertitta will not trade James Harden to Daryl Morey. So it's the type of thing where, like, <laughs> if you're going to be, you know, petty about Morey leaving and not take what is clearly the best offer with Ben Simmons and other assets, I'm not sure what you're really doing here if you're Houston. And if you're a Rockets fan, I don't feel bad, like, in the sense that you've already had those really good years and good runs. I feel bad because I don't feel any confidence in Fertitta to be able to get the proper return that you should get for a guy who's an MVP candidate this season. And like, that's unfortunate that it could go all down the drain so quickly like that. Would it work in Brooklyn? (laughs) I mean, I don't know. Where's the, I mean, like I said that earlier, where is the defense? Well, for me, like, I think I feel before this Harden to Brooklyn thing even became a thing. I've been saying this all year. Like, let's not forget that Kevin Durant still plays basketball. Kevin Durant is incredible. Like, he's been out of sight, out of mind. He's going to come back. I have full confidence he's going to be back from this Achilles injury. We have great modern medicine. He's had plenty of time to rest. He's got a lot to prove. He's going to be fine. He has never been my concern. Kyrie and him working together, all of that coming together, a little problematic. But I don't actually think that Harden, Kyrie, and KD wouldn't work. The only thing for me, um, obviously defense is a little bit of concern. I do think defense is a little overblown in today's NBA. Like you really only, to my, in my opinion, need like one or two decent to strong defenders on your team. Um, and the, it's it's all offense for the most part anyway. But I think it's a role thing. Like who is willing to take that third space, that Chris Bosh space, you know, in that type of setup when you have Kyrie, who's a champion, and you have KD, who's a champion, and you have Harden, who is an MVP, one of the greatest scorers in the history of the league, and wants to be a champion. Like, it's the role thing that matters to me if, for it to work. It almost feels more like the Celtics in 07 when they got – you know, Kevin Garnett and Ray Allen. And those three never had won before. And the big question at that time was, well, how are they going to accept roles? All three of them bought in. They had like their Ubuntu thing that they talked about, buying into the greater good. Brooklyn would need to have something like that because even though Katie and Kyrie won, just their styles of play don't necessarily, to your point, you know, lend itself to that. But I do think in theory, 
it could work. And people talk all the time about James Harden being this ball dominant guy. And he is, he's had some of the greatest scoring seasons we've ever seen in the history of basketball. But if you look back at what he was in OKC when he was their sixth man and his first two years in Houston, he was awesome off the ball, like cutting and using screens to get open, like all the types of like footwork stuff with step backs, you know, and the, you know, the Euro steps we see him do on, on his moves to the rim. He has that same type of feel to get open off the ball. So I wonder if he's the guy that would naturally accept that role behind Kyrie and behind KD. On the other hand, though, with KD coming back from the injury, maybe he wants to ease himself back in. And maybe he is willing to take on a little bit more of a facilitating role in order to get those guys going. And I think it helps the fact they're all friends. Those guys are all friends with each other, especially KD, friends with Kyrie, and friends with James Harden. So it can work. But I do I do have legitimate concerns about the defense. Like the Lakers were a great defensive team. The Raptors were a great defensive team. And the Warriors were, you know, the, the Cavs were in the year that they won it. The Heat were. Like, the teams that win it still have defense. And for Brooklyn, they would have to find the right surrounding pieces, the right glue guys to make it work at the level it can. So speaking of L.A., uh, and one of those big defensive pieces was Rondo. And they brought in Dennis Schroeder, or they're going to bring in Dennis Schroeder once it, once it all goes through. Uh, do you like that piece? And what else does LA need to uh, repeat? Because we know they're going to be back, obviously, but so are a lot of teams like the Warriors <laughs> and the Nets and the Heat are going to be yep. better and the Sixers. So what else do they need besides Schroeder? I mean, Dennis Schroeder is definitely an upgrade. Like Rondo was good in the postseason and he shot over 40%, but I think there's good reason why Lakers fans hated him <laughs> and didn't want him to play because he wasn't good in the play. He wasn't good during the regular season and he couldn't shoot. He got hot in the bubble, but um, for them, Schroeder's just a better overall player. I voted him as sixth man of the year, even though he came in second, I think he should have been the guy uh, for LA. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with the big man position because JaVale McGee, I've heard he's probably leaving or that they just don't want him back. And with Dwight Howard, he has some interest around the league as well that could lure him away. And we still don't even know about Contavious Caldwell Pope. Atlanta could throw money at him. We'll find out with their surrounding pieces. So for L.A., you know, there was a report about a week ago DeMarcus Cousins isn't physically ready after his torn ACL a year ago. So I think for them, they got to find a big. And, and whether that's in free agency or they trade in to find another draft pick, I think finding a big is a priority because as good as McGee and Howard were during the season, there's a reason why those guys got benched later, deeper in the playoffs, because they're just not that quality of player. So L.A., to me, finding a better big for that next round uh, against another big man, whether it's the finals against Giannis, or whether it's you know another Western Conference against Jokic, got to have a big. So the NBA draft is tomorrow, and it's not really – it doesn't feel like the NBA draft. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> but but I am – I'm really curious to see how it goes, because I, I've been following LaMelo Ball since his JBA days – um, and you know, he's obviously a very young man, but that was a couple years ago. So he has, I feel like he has a little bit of a uh, sneaky Luca type experience that people are kind of dismissing because we haven't seen him in college here, but he has been playing internationally amongst other professionals. Obviously he had an injury and there's some questions about him, but what do you think of LaMelo and uh, are, are we, are we overblowing how bad this draft is? I think, you know, just to answer the first part with the draft, it doesn't have a no-brainer number one pick like Zion Williamson or Anthony Davis or John Wall. There's not that guy. And I think when you don't have that guy, people assume it's weak. But this this draft has a lot of top prospects with question marks. Its strength is in its depth. There's a lot of guys that I think are going to be a good player. People like we're not talking about like a Desmond Bain, you know, like those names will be guys who contribute early in their careers. And with the mellow, I have no doubt he's going to be a solid player. I mean, when you're that big at six foot seven, when you're, you're that special as a passer, I mean, some of the plays he makes are just ludicrous. Like you're not going to fail. The question with the mellow to me is what level do you reach as a player does he end up like the 50th best player in the league because he can never tap into uh his scoring ability at the rim because he's like very averse to contact and he settles a lot for floaters around the elbow which i'm sure like wherever he gets drafted are going to infuriate his coaches like he's got to get better at getting to the rim his jump shot he still needs to improve and these are areas that like you look at all the best players in the league 
Like you look at Giannis, you look at LeBron, you look at James Harden. All these guys are so great because in the half court, they have the threat of being able to get to the rim. For some guys, it's the opposite. Steph Curry has the threat on the perimeter that allows him to get to the rim, that opens up playmaking uh, opportunities. LaMelo doesn't have that skill yet, and he's going to be good even without it. But unless he develops that, I don't see greatness in him. And that's okay. Like He's still going to be a good player. But to me, unless that develops, I, I don't... I don't want to. I don't get over the top with my excitement for him as a prospect. He's a good prospect, and he's going to be a fun player with that passing. So, in that sense, like us as fans for content, <laughs> we're winning, right? With a player like him. So, finally, you mentioned it a little bit earlier. Uh, something we completely have kind of moved off of very quickly because of all the Harden news and the draft and everything else. But Chris Paul is headed to <laughs> Phoenix, and he's teaming up with Devin Booker. Uh, a, a, a player that I think is an absolute star yeah. um, and yeah. super fun to watch. That. I think this has made it very interesting. And Phoenix has gone through, obviously, some waves over the past few years. And I, I don't love their ownership at all. But I love Monty Williams and I love what they did in the bubble. So how, how much does this actually improve the Suns? And are they going to be a contender next year? I think it makes Phoenix a team that would be in contention for the play-in tournament, like maybe a seven seed or like the nine seed, and they try to get into a team that could compete for home court advantage. Chris Paul, you're adding Chris Paul, who's still, even in his mid-30s, one of the best point guards in basketball, to Devin Booker. Like, I'm right there with you, Joy. Devin Booker, at worst, he's like the 20th best player in the league. At worst. I mean, this guy is a spectacular scorer, has, is so good off the dribble. He's even better off ball which is what Chris Paul is going to unleash for him. He's going to have less demand for him on the ball, which is going to only make him more of a lethal overall scorer. Factor in DeAndre Ayton get better. Mikhail Bridges and all these quality pieces they have around them and the number 10 pick and the ability to add other guys. To me, like Phoenix, maybe they're just a five seed. Maybe they're just, they're just a four seed. But like one more right move or Booker even getting a little bit better than he already is they could easily elevate into that upper echelon and the West is like a contender for the NBA finals. And it might sound crazy to say, but Chris Paul's that good. And Devin Booker's that good. Well, what he's, what he did this year was incredible. I mean, with a team that I, I honestly thought was tanking. So <laughs> <laughs> like he, he did an incredible job this year. Well, thank you so much for jumping on with us. I know this is a busy time for you. Um, so glad that you're you're safe and you're staying warm <laughs> out there. <laughs> but uh, appreciate it. Make sure you follow Kevin, Kevin O'Connor, MBA on Twitter, if you don't already. And um, stay safe and enjoy the draft and the rest of free agency. Thank you so much, Joy. This was fun. With it. Quit. What? With it. We about to turn up in this bitch. What's up, Heller? What am I winning or quitting today? What's up, Joy? I must be a genius because my hair is looking Einstein-y than a mofo right now. There's nothing I can do about it. This is how we're getting down in the quarantine. But for the for the for those listening, I look nuts. So. <laughs> it's a look. It's your it's your I care about other humans look. Yep, yep. Since you stole my cool haircut look, I gotta. Damn, you're making it look way better than I did. Um, real smooth. All right. Um, okay, so we're gonna do things a little differently today, and would it quit it at least for the first one today, Joy? Uh, we'll get back to the traditionally scheduled programming in a second, but for now, describe. I want you to describe each NFL division with one emoji. Let's start with the division that raised you, like Bane in the fire, uh, with three good teams and your boy Burrow. Joy, what emoji best describes the AFC North? For the AFC North, I'm gonna go with the 100 emoji mm. because Keep it 100. the Steelers are undefeated, so Ooh. they have won 100 percent of their games. Oh, I see what you did. Uh, I see what you did. Are rolling through the NFL right now. So yeah, uh, yeah I mean the AFC North is interesting obviously oh, interesting, yeah. with the ravens and the Bengals and the browns but the steelers have pulled ahead significantly they're obviously going to win that division um mm -hmm. pending a complete meltdown um and they've been incredible this year and mike tomlin was a candidate for coach of the year last year i thought with every year he should be what they did with duck hodges and mason rudolph and i think he's done an incredible job this year obviously <laughs> Duck Hodges. Forgot about that. 
<laughs> trying to forget that happened. But yeah. the AFC North still super competitive. I don't care about what the Ravens did in a monsoon against the Patriots. They're still good. I love Joe Burrow. I love how right I was about Joe Burrow. And right. well, I don't think that Cleveland is really going to end up being anything, and they're probably going to move off Baker within the next year. They're still a fun and competitive yeah. team. So, but undefeated, 100. That's the AFC North. Yep, nailed it. Browns are playing good football. I don't know if Baker is going to get them much past that, but they're playing solid ball. Um, and the Bengals aren't trash. They're not trash no more, just like that. Um, okay, let's move south to a division that constantly seems in flux. Uh, the best team just lost to the other team. Uh, what emoji would you use to sum up the AFC South? So I'm going to go with a crown for King Henry. Mm, I was wondering if that who that crown was for. Yes, it's for King Henry. Friend of the show, Derek Henry. Oh, that is correct. What's up, dog? Yeah. Um, I still think that the Titans will end up winning this division. I, I, yeah. I understand the Colts have a really great defense. And I do like their offensive weapons, minus Phillip Rivers. But I just feel like the Titans go through, they go as Derrick Henry goes, which is why he should have been paid first. Right. And while all this talk about Ryan Tannehill is great and he has oh, stepped boy. up significantly since his time with the Dolphins, I still think that team runs through King Henry. So I'm going to mm-hmm. give the AFCs and the other two so the teams are irrelevant, so we're not, we're not getting into them. But right. it's between the Colts. And the Titans, and I am still leaning into the Titans in this division, and I still think it depends on Derrick Henry. Yep. Uh, it's too bad that Deshaun Watson is on the team he's on, because otherwise I feel like we would be talking about him if we had any good reason to for this division. But oh well. That's how it goes sometimes. Uh, maybe next year. Okay, uh, if you were going to name this next division after someone, it would be the AFC Bill Belichick. What emoji best represents the 2020 AFC East. 2020 AFC East is a palm tree. Now, I didn't say the Dolphins, but a palm tree. His Dolphins was too obvious. But clearly it's Tua. Uh, right. And, you know, Tua grew up around a bunch of palm trees, too. So ah, it's like, I see. I was wondering if the island culture... I, I, can the island culture, you think, translate from Hawaii? I've never been to Hawaii, but I have been to Florida. And there, there's palm trees in both. Do you think it's it's... I think it translates. Hawaii is quite different than Florida. Um, <laughs> quite, quite different. But um, they both have beaches and they both have palm trees. Um, and they clearly produce awesome franchise quarterbacks because hey, here comes hey. Tua to the Miami Dolphins and they've won five in a row. Obviously, the Bills are still super competitive and they don't have palm trees there. But yeah. I like the Dolphins to win this division. I think you're going to finish out the season strong. And at the very least, be a wild card team and be a problem. So I, I'm all in on the Dolphins as usual, but this time I can actually do it with some actual right, confidence right as opposed yeah. to being a homer and knowing how this sad story is going to end. I love Tua. He's been incredible. I also love being right about transitioning to Tua, which is always wonderful for me personally. I enjoy yep. that. So, um, yes, yep. a palm tree for the AFC East. Yeah, take 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 your flowers. I, you're probably right about the uh, Dolphins and this being their year, but I just feel still between the Bills and who I, and I love Josh Allen and then the Monsoons, the Patriots. They're now the Monsoon team. They, they, watch, they'll be a Monsoon. Whenever they need rain, it'll come for them. It rains on the Patriots this year. So I almost think, do they still have the emoji of like the? old guy blowing uh cold uh air is that still an emoji like the wizard yeah i feel like that emoji might not blow down a couple of those palm trees that you were thinking of using i just think that the patriots are not that far out of it they're still competitive bill belichick doesn't lose games and the bills are a little more exciting so i think the dolphins next year but i'm still I'm still going, uh, it's it's too cold for palm trees still in that division for me. Um, yeah, they got like, it's not like an old guy. It's like a wind person or something, like blowing right. air out. Yeah, they still got that one. Right, I, that's the one I would have chosen. Um, okay, um, all right. Uh, imagine a Dub C walking in the background uh, as I introduce the hardest division in the league. Uh, the only place where you can watch a pirate fight a chief Joy, describe the AFC West West y'all in emoji in the name of the streets. You know what I mean? Uh, I am going to go with a trophy because the Chiefs are still the, the champions of the NFL. They're still the best team. I say that as a Steelers fan um, because the, Steelers, okay. the Chiefs are playing incredible. Now that 
that might change. If they lose to the Raiders again this week, mm. then they lose that, that top mantle and it's got to go to the Steelers. The um, Raiders. The, the Raiders. Who have been playing well, by the way. But they're still not on the Chiefs level um, and nowhere close despite that win. But um, the Chiefs still the best team in the league and they get the trophy at, at the top of their division and still playing like the championship team that they are. So trophy for the AFC West. Yep, I'm checking. You're probably right. I'm checking to see if there's an eye patch emoji just in case the Raiders do win. And we'll have to switch it to that. I guess you could just go the one eye, Cyclops style, and that would imply that a patch was over the other one. They but, don't have uh, a pirate? They probably have a pirate in there somewhere. I just didn't. I thought there's no person with an eye patch, I don't think. I mean, aren't the Raiders like another version of a pirate? Yeah, they are. Is there a pirate emoji? I don't know. Let's see if I type <laughs> I've never had pirate, to use a pirate if, if anything emoji. happens. Oh, there's a pirate flag. It's a pirate flag. Okay, yeah. It's, it's a pirate flag. flag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, an autumn blow the pirate flag blowing in an autumn wind is the Raiders emoji. Okay. Um, now we're on to the NFC, right? We did the AFC. We're done. We're done. All with the AFC, yes. Cool. All right. Uh, on to the NFC. Um, I would call this division the NFC least, but they already took all the L's joy. Uh, <laughs> what emoji best describes the NFC East? Obviously a poop emoji. We don't need to spend yeah. a lot of time on the NFC East. The only bright spot in this terrible trash division is the New York football giants. Who are trending in the right direction. I like Daniel Jones. They are. Uh, I like that they've bought into Joe Judge and he seems to be doing the right things there. Yep. So he they are the one uh they're the one bright spot in this poop division of the NFC East. Uh but yeah, we can't spend a lot of time on this this division's trash. I, yeah, I don't use the trash yeah, I guess, can, but it's just it's poop is better. Right. I think I think this segment was birthed out of someone calling that division the poop emoji division. So I think that's where this bit came from. And for the rest of my time, I will just would just like Donnie to roll with audio. Joe Judge falling on the fumble in the mud. Oh, he did it. It was so team building. And that's enough. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, all right. So now for this one, picture Mac Dre gigging. You know what I'm saying? Uh, um, th- uh, things, are, things are about to get hyphy, Joy. Uh, the 49ers would be leading the previous division. But they're fourth in this one. Joy, one emoji. Uh, what's the NFC West like? The NFC West is a paw print because mm. the 49ers, your 49ers are out of it. Ah. And the, they're out of it. They're out of it. It's not your year. It's okay. You had a nice year last year. Go bounce back. We're, better, we're still better than everyone in the NFC East, though. Congrats. Um, yes, you can do that if you yeah. like. If that makes you feel good. It but does, actually. It does. The rest it of this division is all animals. Obviously, uh, birds don't have paw prints, so I couldn't find a like claw print a kinda. claw print thing. But, yeah. you know, the rest of this division is uh, competitive, and they're all fighting for the top of this division, and it's it's insane. Like, they keep beating each other. <laughs> the horse race, yeah. And mm-hmm. it's wild. Uh, and they're all super fun teams. Um, I can't imagine what it would be like if the 49ers were actually competitive in this division. It would be impossible. Murder, bro. Um, it might be it might be the best division uh, in the NFC. Uh, I can't go I can't go in in, in the NFL yet because uh, there's some definite problems with the Seahawks for sure. Yeah. But really exciting, really exciting division. Um, glad that the Rams are back competitive again because that was nonsense that uh, Sean McVay wasn't a genius anymore. Um, they still got things working, no, and exactly. Kyler Murray's incredible, and obviously Russ is having to do everything in the entire kitchen and run the restaurant and do the takeout orders as well. But, yeah, so I'm going to do a paw print, even though the birds in this division obviously don't pause, if that makes sense. Right, right. They're, they're really asking Russ to cook it and deliver it, aren't they? Oh, they want him to deliver it and then be back on time to take right. the other orders and wait the tables. And then they have to wash the dishes also. Right, right. And, and, and nothing can go wrong either, or else they lose anyway. It's ridiculous. Um, okay, uh, this, is, this next division is the only division with a team that doesn't have a majority owner – and that team's the only one that's threatening for a title. Crazy. Burr, what emoji best describes the NFC North? Uh, cheese. Cheesehead. Packers are the only team that matters in this division. I know the right. Vikings are playing better as of late. Well, but... the, the, the Packers are the only team that matters, and then the Vikings have Dalvin Cook, right? Yes. 
Yes, exactly. Uh, Dalvin Cook deserves better. And <laughs> and that's just yeah. a fact. But the Packers are also the only team that matters in this division. And they're, they did nothing to improve from what they were last year. Uh, this game this weekend was a, a tragedy to watch. There's no reason that the Jags should be anywhere near uh, competitive with you in, right. in that game. And it's because, again, if you ever get physical with the Packers, then they start to fall apart. And look, I understand it's the NFL, and every NFL team has NFL players any given Sunday, whatever cliche you want to use. Mm. So there's, there, there shouldn't be a blowout every single game anyway. But nevertheless, that's that's not a good sign that they're still being pushed around no matter what, how good or terrible the team is. But it doesn't matter. They're still going to win this division going away. And I do think that they will win uh, – one or two playoff games, but once they run up to somebody with an actual right. defense, they're going to have a problem. Um, you ho-hummed your way through the Any Given Sunday speech, but you uh, gave the shit out of that speech once, a t- once upon a time for Halloween. Inches. <laughs> exactly. Fingers. Mm. Claw. You scratch for that inch. Um, it's really too bad that the Bears aren't more competitive because their defense is amazing. And if I remember correctly, and I could be mistaken here, Weren't they in the running for Cam Newton this offseason, potentially? Yeah. Oh, man. But they've got, they paid Nick Foles a lot instead. Oh, dang. Well, yeah, and, like, you know, the thing about the Bears is I'm so tired of the Bears. That game last night was – it hurt my eyes, to be honest with you. Yeah. It, it was – It was. I, I just couldn't even believe that that was happening. Um not a good game and yeah one day the bears are going to wake up and realize that they need a quarterback in order to win in this league yeah when that day is no (laughs) one knows but if someone could just send them a memo or like a note um maybe just some some video of like Kyler Murray or Tua I don't know something anything just you need a quarterback it's just there's no trick around it Uh, it's upsetting because you're right they do have a good defense and I've been saying that for a while now that they need to go all in on getting a quarterback what do I know? You know, you're just terrible on offense. Yeah. Yep. That's that that's that that's that Cutler curse that has you trading up for a uh uh junior quarterback or something with like ten starts from North Carolina. Uh <laughs> why? Okay. Beauty before age leaves us with only one division left. It's basically the retirement home, but everybody's still working. Joy, describe the NFC South with one emoji. Uh they still man emoji. For sure. Because (laughs) the NFC South is dominated by Tom Brady and Drew Brees. Um, Drew Brees, who now has is completely banged up, same as last year, and Jameis Winston is gonna have to step in and hopefully uh keep this keep the ship rolling. (sighs) I'm really interested to see how this goes because we could be watching the future of the New Orleans Saints in this uh audition for the next couple games. They're saying it's optimistically Drew could be out two weeks. He's going to be out at least three weeks, possibly four. I'm guessing four. He has five fractured ribs and like a fractured lung or something. Like it's, he's going to be out for a while. A stretch similar to the Teddy Bridgewater stretch. And right. That's what I'm thinking. That could be really good for the Bucs or really bad for the Bucs because they could just keep winning and Jameis Winston has some production without all the turnovers. But either way, an old, old men define this division and so they get the old man emoji. Yep, nailed it. Uh, yeah, it's the Drew Brees furlough portion of the NFL season where he sustains an injury that doesn't knock him out for the year but gives him a good reason to rest up for those playoff games down the stretch, hopefully. Um, I mean, this is bad. Like, if he doesn't – if he can't return to something this year, it's it's time for those Saints fans to get those old brown bags out, start drawing on them again because, I mean, it's – the Saints could have looked a lot different. They they went all in this year. They're in what I believe to be a, a complicated salary cap situation next year. So, yeah, it could be right. bad, but we'll see. I, I think that Jameis is going to do a good job, though. I, I, I do think he's not going to be able to get away completely from the turnovers because that's just his style of play. But <laughs> he said that he wanted to go there and learn, you know, how to be better. He wanted an MBA and how to be a quarterback. So if he's been paying attention, then we'll see. But either way, it's super oh, interesting. Man. Oh man, his style of play is interceptions. That is Jameis. I mean, that eat is. that W. Yeah. yeah. Um, I okay. Can't watch it. I cannot watch that video. I can't. I, 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 I swipe so fast, so fast past it. Like I just don't want to see it. Just please no. Well, he 
you saw him when he when they were dancing in the locker room. He ate the W while he was dancing again. He thinks it's cool. It's so awkward to me. Like it's so it's so awkward to me. Which, and then the also, part I'm for like me, such a germaphobe. I'm like, yeah. oh, the fingers. Yeah. Thing, no, no, no. I guess it's, it's, they're picking up their their mouth helmets, guard and putting it in their mouth anyway. Socks. Oh, I'm not worried about it. Yep. It's the it's the only way for <laughs> eating a W is the only way I can think of for an adult to get hands as grubby as a baby's. You know, because <laughs> otherwise you're not combining saliva and dirt like that, unless you're unless you're. A baby. The, th- the mere thought of putting my hands, which I know are clean, because I'm at home and I wash my hands oh, every yeah. time I walk past the sink, in my mouth is like giving me anxiety. Like thinking about it. Do you ever? Um, we might have to cut this part, but do you ever, when you're driving in the car uh, and you see something that looks dirty, use some hand sanitizer? Okay. okay cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I also have, uh, well, I just ran out, but I, I normally have antibacterial wipes in the car. So like anything I touch frequently, like the, yeah. my wheel, my door handle, so all that stuff gets gets wiped down. Yeah. Shoulders, chest, pants, shoes, wipe me down. Um, all right. <laughs> um, okay. So we're going to get back into our normal win it or quit it formatting here. Um, and let's have some fun. How much fun might you ask? Unlimited fun. Uh, Joy, Russell Wilson once told the Seahawks from bed with Sierra, Seattle, we got ourselves a deal. At that time, we were weirded out and we thought that the deal was just a contract extension until 2023. But we now know that written into the fine print of that so-called deal was a stipulation that required so-called Danger Russ to play great in the beginning of every season and then start to fall apart down the stretch and inevitably fall out of the MVP race. Joy, Russ can't cook up another Super Bowl for the Seahawks. Wit it or quit it. Oh, wit it. Um, he's he's definitely struggling as of late, but it's not his fault. He has to do everything. Like we right. we saw at the beginning of the season they were being a little restrictive and then you know the, the let Russ cook things started. And so now they opened up the offense a little bit. But now, like, they expect Russ to run the whole restaurant. Like, it's, you can't, you can't do house. everything. You can't do delivery. He can't be the cook, the chef, the, the waitress, the, you know, uh, greeter bartender. at the door. Like, bartender, uh, hostess, Bus manager. Boy. Yeah, we're just listing all the, all the jobs. And listen, he does have DK Metcalf. He has some, some, he has some playmakers on the team. But the problem is the defense is not good enough. Cool. And Bad. It, it's, it, he's always having to press. And whether you're Russell Wilson or Tom Brady, or it doesn't matter who you are or how great you are, if you're having to press and you feel like you have to make 21 point plays in one play, you're going to make <laughs> bad decisions. And like we've seen tons of, I feel like Carson Wentz does this all the time. Like Carson Wentz is not a bad quarterback, but he, he plays in a way that it's like, bro, you just need a first down. All yep. you need here is a first down. And then. We can talk about the next play, but like, stop trying to win the game in every single play. And that's what Russ is having to do. And and sometimes it's even better to punt it than to throw an interception. You see, if you don't get the first down, that's not good. But turning it over right then is is worse. worse. Is worse. It's actually worse. And that's that's what's going on with the Seahawks. He's having to right. do everything. He's having to try and win the game in every single play. And he does need to get away from that because he's better than that. Like he does need to take a step back, realize like if we're just gonna lose, we're gonna lose and it's not gonna be on me. And maybe this just isn't our season, but I can't keep forcing you know, right. these plays and turning the ball over. Now they have the biggest game of their season on Thursday night against the Cardinals because as are we're you gonna, gonna are you gonna we'll probably hear you talk about it on television that night, right? Yes, you can watch me on Prime Video uh, on Scout Speed. Uh, and Twitch Scout Speed! Slash Move the Sticks. Um, but this is the biggest game of their season. Like, this is a division game, and they are they are struggling right now. So they've lost their last two games. Last game was a division loss. They've already lost to the Cardinals, so they can't yep. lose twice in division. They really mm-hmm. need this game. It's a short week. It is at home. So it is advantage Seahawks, but yeah, this is um, this is a huge game for them on Thursday, and hopefully everything settles down and they can get the dub, or their season is really in jeopardy because uh, I mean they're gonna they, they could very quickly fall out of wa- the wild card contention as well as contention for the division. I mean they're six and one through their first seven games, and he was twenty six touchdowns, six interceptions, 
and sacked then, 19 times, hit 50. In the last two games, he's been sacked 11, hit 23 times. So obviously, the offensive line is struggling a lot too. But he has four interceptions and three fumbles in the last two games. That's not going to cut yeah. it. They got to get it together. So I'm, I'm obviously they're coming off of a rough loss to the Rams. <laughs> Kyler Murray and the Cardinals are coming in high off of that last second hail mary to DeAndre Hopkins. Shout so out Bill O'Brien. Um, so amazing moment. Kyler Murray's playing out of his mind right now, and obviously the two of them are riding high. So this is a really interesting game. Maybe one of the biggest games of the season, but certainly the biggest game of the season for the Seahawks. Uh, most definitely. Uh, that division is a killer division, and I'm not saying that I believe this, but I'm just saying that this these two things are true. Around the same time, that the Seahawks and Russell Wilson sort of started to take this downturn is around the same time that someone else signed Antonio Brown, which is who Russ really, really wanted. So I don't, you know, you and I have talked about Antonio Brown. Neither of us are, you know, uh, dying on that hill, good, bad, or otherwise. But, uh, you know, when you're asking everything of Russ and he asks one thing of your team, it would be cool if you could do it, that's all. That's my only thought from all of that. So I'm not saying that's why that they've they've backslid the way they have, but I bet Russ probably still wants Antonio Brown. He definitely he definitely did, but you know their problems are not their receivers. Like their right. problems are their offensive line is letting Russ get thrown around, and they've right. got to get some stops on defense. But yes, I'm with you. Uh, he he probably would have wanted a little more help if it was available they have bigger problems though but this game thursday is going to be huge um absolutely before we go really quickly uh did kevin connor say anything that uh uh james harden is definitively not coming to the warriors (laughs) he did not mention the warriors at all (laughs) so i don't think he did say though that that they need the the rockets need to stall and wait for the best deal so if, Hell they, no. if the Warriors want to put together a package, no. I don't think that they do, but if the Warriors no. want to put together a package, then he said that, that he didn't mention the Warriors, but he said a team should, he the, the Rockets should listen to a team with a better package than the Nets. No, joy. no, no, no. I was going to ask you if you could just tell me that it wasn't going to happen so I would feel better, but you just did the opposite. No, you came it's up not going to happen. The Warriors, the Warriors are not going to give away uh, the franchise for... I don't want to anything away i don't want james harden on the warriors i'll blake i'll take blake griffin uh i would have taken chris paul i'll take uh all these other people that we've rumored to, that are former enemies of ours there was someone else uh russ i'll take russ anyone but james joy anyone but james it's not that i dislike him personally it's that i don't like the way he plays basketball and i've said that to too many people yeah that's true because you'd have to buy in um, I don't think it's going to happen. I think, you, I think you're good. Katie, Katie was a fine buy-in. I was willing to do that. James, I don't want to do it. Well, I don't think you'll have to, but the, Rocket, the, the Nets are going to be fun if he ends up there. So it's going to be something else minus defense. <laughs> yes. What's up, Donnie? What's going on a high-key, low-key this week? What's up? All right, high key. We are headed into week 11 of the NFL season, and the Eagles lead the NFC East with three wins. That's 10 weeks, three wins, and they're number one. Low key, it's crazy that the winner of this division is going to host a playoff game. Joy, which of these teams will be the least, the worst of the bunch and come out as champs? Oh, I really feel like it would be a disgrace, low key, to call the winner of this division. The NFC East champs, unless, <laughs> unless okay. it is the Giants. Here's why. Why is that? Um, well, because the Eagles are terrible, and they don't deserve to win this division. And the Cowboys are terrible, and they don't deserve to win this division. And uh, I think the Washington football team is still in this division, but we don't ever talk about that. <laughs> yeah. The Giants are actually the only team in this division that are trending in an upwards direction. Right. Like they're like moving in the right way. They're getting better every single week. We're learning new things about Daniel Jones. For example, dude is really fast. Now we knew he could run before. (laughs) We just didn't know he could run all the way into the end zone, which he did this time. But he's very athletic. He's (laughs) he's getting better every single week. They've clearly bought into Joe Judge, which I like. I wasn't sure about him. I'm not really into all that rah-rah stuff, but 
They mm-hmm. seem to like it. They're doing all this without Working. Saquon Barkley, which is their offensive leader. I like yeah. what they're doing. They're still not a great overall football team, but they're the Miami of last year. So they have a they have their coach in place. They've got their quarterback. They're getting better every week. They play with energy and they have good losses, if you will. And they just beat the Eagles. So they have some wins too. <laughs> like this division yeah. is still up for grabs and it's gonna come down to the last week of the of the season. Um, which, you know, like we know this division is bad, but to me, it will actually matter if the Giants win the division. If the Eagles win, it's like, okay, whatever. They squeaked out some wins. They still have massive problems. If the Cowboys do it, it's the same thing. Like I didn't learn anything about it. If Washington yeah. does, I guess it means we're going to see more of Alex Smith next year. Yeah, so I guess that me, would, yeah. I really feel like it only matters if the Giants win the division. And I think that they will at this point. I, I hear you. It's just, to me as a Lions fan, it's really annoying that a team with five or six wins could potentially be a division champ. I'm like, can can the Lions change positions? Detroit is kind of east. It's Definitely more east than Dallas is. So, I mean, that that's my take on it. I know. I, I understand. It's, it's I, look, we can't get away with divisions just because the division is bad one year. Um, <laughs> I, I know how frustrating it probably is, but like, you got to beat, you got to beat your, you have to win your division first. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, I'm trying to find something to say about the Lions that's nice. I don't know. No, don't 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 put too much effort into it. It's a waste of your time and my time. <laughs> All right. High key, when comparing the two NFL conferences, one clearly has more question marks than the other one. You've got Jameis Winston taking over for Drew Brees. The Seahawks are kind of backsliding a little bit, and the Buccaneers consistently coming with the inconsistencies. Loki, what's up with the disarray in the NFC? I don't know. The AFC is just finally better. I think it's a lot of old and older guys. At the top of the NFC, obviously, of the Bucks with Tom Brady. Mm-hmm. You have Drew Brees, who is now injured with the Saints. You have Aaron Rodgers, who's not old, but he's a part of it's that older. next level of right. quarterbacks. I mean, they drafted his quote-unquote replacement this year, <laughs> yeah. um, which is obviously a joke. But, you know, he's he's not he's not a young guy. So I think mm-hmm. that that's what it is. Like, it, it, there's also a lot of bad defenses. Yeah, so that's true. it's it's really just it's not the same dominant uh, division. Like we thought that the NFC was going to be that. Now, obviously, San Francisco is out of the conversation this year, having Jimmy Garoppolo out and their you know big defensive pieces gone. So that changed things as well. But you know, the Seahawks don't have a defense. Everything is reliant on on Russell Wilson. Russ, so yeah. it's just it's just a di- different conference now. All of the the complete teams are in the AFC or close to com- complete teams are in the AFC. Obviously, the Chiefs and Steelers at top of the NFL right now. But I, I think that's what it is. It's just a, a, a mixture of no defense teams and older guys at the top. And I, I don't know. It's it's really going to be interesting who ends up in the Super Bowl for the NFC this year. Yeah, we'll see. All right, high key. One of the NBA's most dominant regular season teams appears to be headed for a rebuild. I'm talking about the playoff averse Houston Rockets. Low key, if the rumors are true and James Harden to the Nets is a possibility, is this good news for Brooklyn fans or a recipe for the most entertaining kind of a disaster? Which is it? I think it's, I think it's good news for Brooklyn fans. If I was a Nets fan, I'd be excited about it. Like you got Ecstatic, Harden, Kyrie, yeah. and KD. Like what more can you ask for? But I really think this only works, and I said this with Kevin O'Connor earlier, this only works if everyone buys into their roles. Like, people talk about super teams and, you know, guys teaming up and it's unfair and whatever. (laughs) Listen, you have to make sacrifices when you have three stars on your team. I know this because I covered the Miami Heat and they are my team when LeBron came there. What happened the first year? Right? It didn't work. Why? Right. Everyone hadn't figured out their roles yet. Everyone hadn't bought into their roles yet. This notorious story that Dwayne Wade told LeBron James, this is your team now. This is your city. Like, you be the guy. And when that happened, what happened? They won two championships, right? And went to three straight finals after that initial finals run. You have to mm-hmm. buy into the role. Steph Curry took a back seat, not a big back seat, but still a back seat a to step. Kevin Durant, yeah. a step back. You have to assume roles. The NBA is obviously a superstar league, but if you're going to win championships, you have to play your role, even as a star, the best 
to your to the best of your ability and you have to let the leader and the best player on the team be the best best player on the team and sometimes he may need help night by night yeah. that might move and flex a little bit and be a little bit of a living breathing thing but at the end of the day in the biggest moments that's what it has to be and teams that have put together these super teams and had success that was the main ingredient role players completely bought into their role were completely unselfish and the stars knew when to take a step back when to take a step forward when to rely on their role players how to trust each other and that takes a lot of chemistry it takes a lot mm -hmm. of uh, work it takes a lot of preparation and it takes a great leader and and honestly a coach that knows how to deal with those kind of personalities and keep everybody happy because it's a long season and a lot can change and people get moody and things are said and yeah. you know nba coaches don't really get a lot of credit but you look at eric spolstra and steve kerr you know as of late doc rivers like these are these are men that have been able to relate to and keep these monster personalities uh as they should be because they're superstars but these big personalities all working together and buying into roles that otherwise if they were the only guy on the team the guy on the team they wouldn't have to play yeah. so i think it's great i'm totally into it but i only think it works if that happens and you see you've seen it every time like when lebron goes somewhere somebody has to become the third guy like if it's kevin love it's, it's chris bosh like there's got to be something like obviously with the lakers it's it's a kind of a different nba now with only two superstars so the third guy is always going to be the third guy on the lakers but yeah and that's going to change night by night but when you have three stars on a team somebody has got to be in that lesser role and it's pr probably going to be very consistent because that's going to be how your team is built so is it kyrie is it is it james harden you know, does James Harden take over that that alpha spot and KD takes a step back as he's still easing in from his injury? Like, how does that, how does that all work if this happens? Yeah. But I think roles are the most important part in in the success of a, a championship level team when you have that many stars. I have a lot of uh, friends who are from Houston and who are Houston Rockets fans, and I feel like from this pr from their perspective or from the perspective of a Houston person. This is also still good because we are, as NBA fans, we're tired of seeing the same thing. Like, I feel like the Houston story got repetitive last year. Like, we, we got that story. So just a change up is good for, for Houston and him going to Brooklyn would be amazing. Yeah, I think. I agree. All right. High key, former executive M. Ng made history this week when the Miami Marlins hired her as the first woman to serve as GM of a team in the four major North American sports. Loki is about damn time. Women have had a profound effect on sports throughout history, and this accomplishment is honestly long overdue. Yes, uh, hi, Key. I was very excited to see this news. Uh, congrats to Kim Ang and the Marlins. Wonderful move. Obviously, her and Derek Jeter have a long-standing relationship, so yeah. you know that obviously played a role in this happening. Um, Loki, I will say, thirty years seems like an appropriate resume to become a GM in yeah. any major sports league. And, you know, I didn't see a whole lot of um, pushback on this. I, I didn't dig too deep, obviously, also because, you know, I got stuff to yeah. do and I really am not interested in what, you know, sure these uh, weirdos have to say about it. But <laughs> I will say I didn't see the immediate pushback that I think sometimes people expect when a hire like this um, is made. It's a first hire, uh, first woman, first, you know, Asian American woman in this space. Um, but I, I will just say like, this is, this is a, obviously a huge step and, you know, breaking through that glass ceiling is super important. I just want to remind anyone who has like, you know, who has something to say about it or is like, well, I really hope she's there, you know, just because of her resume, like, yes, she is there because of her resume. Yeah. She has Check 30 resume. years of experience. <laughs> overqualified. Overqualified. <laughs> yeah. Overwhelmingly overqualified yeah. for this position. And the overwhelming part is what always still bothers me about these situations because obviously I'm super proud and I don't want to focus on the negative, but like when you're making hires, a woman shouldn't have to be this overqualified to prove yeah. that she belongs in that space. And hopefully her breaking through this and being hired will then open doors so that it doesn't have to be such a, a long overdue situation. And, you know, I'm asked about this right. all the time about, you know, being a woman in a, in a traditionally 
uh, man's space, if you will, which I don't believe this is a man's space, but you know, sure. Um, what it is, is you always have to be overqualified. You always have to be better. You always have to have more experience. You always have to have uh, yeah. more credentials and more networking and more and more and more just to get to like the basic level, not even probably to get where you're supposed to be, but just get to like a basic level, um, in this business and in lots of businesses. And so I hope that this is what the catalyst for what starts to change that. Um, and just make, not, we're never going to be fair, right? Like, I don't believe in life is fair, I like to function in reality, but hopefully, yeah. you know, it starts to move the conversation forward where it doesn't have to be, we eventually get away from having so many firsts, but congrats yeah. to, to Kim and the Marlins. I'm really looking forward to seeing what she does with them. Yeah. But just to piggyback off of what you just said, I am also very ready for more of these firsts to be behind us. I know we're still waiting on a woman head coach our first woman head coach. I feel like that's, that's coming. Uh, we just got our first woman vice president. We're still waiting on a woman, our first black lady governor. These, there's a lot of firsts that are like yet to come, and I can't wait for them to be in the past. <laughs> for them to no longer be first. Yeah, exactly. Let's get on to like our second or third. <laughs> hey, T, what's going on in Culture Report this week? Hey, Joy. So the weekend has just been announced to perform at the Super Bowl halftime show on Sunday, uh, February 7th, which is like in a few months. It's coming so fast. Um, I, I think that's a great choice. You know, I love the weekend, love his voice. He makes great music. He had a pretty great year album wise. After Hours was really great. Um, and he didn't have any features. So to me, I think, it, again, it makes sense. Um, I heard they were bringing out a special guest. Um, it was rumored that there may be Justin Bieber. Who knows? I'm not sure who came up with that, but um, this is wishful thinking for me. I don't know. I, I'm obsessed with Frank Ocean and I miss him so much. I would love for him to just pop out. Like, can, can Frank Ocean just pop out with The weekend and just make my whole life? <sighs> that would be so fun. I was not expecting to hear that name. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, th- I like Bieber too, though. I wouldn't hate Bieber. Yeah popping out for the Super Bowl. You know, everyone always has a big opinion about the Super Bowl halftime show. And I've just gotten to a point where I just accept whatever the Super Bowl halftime show is going to give me, and I'm just going to enjoy it. I was really disappointed in the Atlanta Super Bowl. I'm not going to lie. I felt like it could have really had some Atlanta flavor. And it was like very unseasoned Atlanta. Um, You know, we got (laughs) some appearances, but it just needed to be more... Uh, Miami was amazing, obviously not uh, Miami artists, but it was still fun, electric, you know, very, very entertaining. Shakira and J-Lo killed it. So, uh, you know, Latina power, I was here for all of it and I loved it. But I'm really not trying to like build up huge expectations for the Super Bowl halftime show every single year. I think the weekend is a great choice. People get all crazy about like who it should be, but at the end of the day, it needs to be somebody you can put on a very entertaining show that everyone's going to enjoy. And they haven't always nailed that part of it, but as long as it's something that, you know, you can sit there and watch and be entertained. You don't need to be thrilled. You don't need to be floored. And I do think it has to have some kind of, you know, tie into whatever the city is. So the weekend obviously doesn't, I don't think, have a tie to Tampa. But, you know, you need to just, you need to be relevant. And I love The weekend, love his music. And it's, it's crossover music. Everyone knows who The weekend is. So, you know, gone are the days of Prince and Michael. And I don't think Beyonce is doing it anymore either. Um, but <laughs> I love Lady Gaga's. Uh, Katy Perry killed it as well. And I, like I said, I think J-Lo and Shakira did an amazing job. So I'm looking forward to it. I, I'm really curious to see who he brings out. The features are kind of a fun part of it. Once you get, you know, past the buzz of whoever is going to be performing. But it's going to be different this year. The Super Bowl is going to be really interesting because obviously we are still in a pandemic. So I don't know what the fan situation is going to be. I don't know what the I th- I doubt they're going to have people on the field like they usually do for the actual show. So it could look very different, but um, I'm looking forward to it either way. I, they've done an amazing job with everything. So I'm sure the, the halftime performance is going to be great, too. Absolutely. All right. So Zero f- Given dropped on Netflix. It's Kevin Hart's latest stand-up, and <laughs> I watched it this morning. It's, it's pretty good. Uh, the show took place in his house, which I thought was cool. I love how he had fans come to, like, the comfort of his home and to hear him do comedy. Joy, he calls, you know, COVID a uh, vid, 
And I can't stop saying it. I'm like, I've heard of like COVID, you know, or Rona, but it, he calls it vid. I think it's hilarious. But um, he talks about embracing like his celebrity. He, of course, he talks about his wife, his kids, his ex-wife briefly. Um, and I literally, I, I love Kevin Hart. And I respect Kevin Hart uh, for his hustle. That man works. I think after almost dying last year, I think it's so cool to see him back in his element. So if you're tired of hearing him talk about his kids and his wife, he addresses that. You know, he said that's all he got. So he talks about, like, what he goes through on the daily. And so that's what you'll expect. Um, and then, of course, you know, he still can't fight. But uh, I just love how he can, you know, laugh at himself as always. I'm really looking forward to watching this. It kind of snuck up on me. Um, but, you know, we're all kind of putting content out there. I like Kevin Hart a lot. I know people get kind of crazy about comedians. Like they feel like they go too commercial or something. And you know, everybody can't be a pure artist. It just, you know, you start getting checks offered to you to do these movies and these shows and you're gonna start taking them too. I'm telling you, you are. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think Kevin Hart's done, had an incredible career and um, you know, he's he's still very, very, very funny. Like he, he's, He's not taking the Eddie Murphy uh, like disappearing thing. And as Eddie Murphy's back, we love him the same. You know what I mean? So how people handle their careers is how they handle it. I am definitely going to watch because I need some laughs during these times. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm glad that you, you could give me a full review and that it's funny. So I'm definitely gonna watch. <laughs> yeah, it is. No, it, it is. It's, it's very funny. But yeah, I love Kevin Hart too. Um, so I also love this person, Megan the Stallion. Like we, we're Megan Stallion stands. We just love her. Um, I can't get enough of her. She, um, she is GQ Magazine's Rapper of the Year, well deserved. She is absolutely beautiful. She's so likable and funny. I just love her personality. There's this video, Joy, on a uh, YouTube. Um, that's what's well, under GQ on YouTube, and she's like undercover answering social media questions, and I just love it. Um, she just seems really down to earth and chill, and. Like I said, love it. But I also found out, I don't know how I missed this, her album comes out on Friday. She just dropped the track list like literally a few hours ago. Yeah. I'm so really excited about that. 17 songs. <laughs> 17 songs, girl. Uh, yes, I'm looking forward to the album. I love all the artwork for it. Um, good news, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to it. Meg has obviously had a very a uh, crazy year, just like the rest of us in her own unique way. But she's very inspiring to me. I, first of all, she's in incredible shape. So every time I see a picture of her, I'm like, oh, it's not fair, <laughs> but she's right? amazing. She's amazing. And I'll definitely be checking out the album. <laughs> totally deserve for rapper of the year. Cause she's been doing nothing but giving us bops all year. Um, for a while now, actually. So um, I'm glad that she's getting her flowers and I'll definitely be checking out the album this weekend. I will I will be as well. I think I need to like get my knees ready. <laughs> oh, the knees have no chance. The way, the way my knees are set up, it's it's a no. I need the chair for, you know, balance. Like then maybe I could get, if I have, if we have the wall, you know, perhaps if we can hold, we can hold hands. <laughs> Right. I can't be you have to literally in, be hold No. Away. Like the days of the dropping and the getting back up, no, it's not for me anymore. But I can think about it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> in my head I feel like I can do it inside a tent and I have to hold the wall. So I was watching from afar. You know, yeah. we can't be going to the hospital <laughs> these days, so we're just gonna you know oh. we're gonna do the seat dancing. Like yeah. these. This is safe. Yes. Is safe. <laughs> the two step. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us this week, guys. Make sure you're staying safe, wear a mask, subscribe on YouTube, follow us on social media at Maybe I'm Crazy Pod and Joy Taylor Talks. And you can listen to the podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, iHeartMedia app, or Apple Podcasts. Stay safe, guys. Maybe I'm crazy, maybe I'm not. Ooh.